Zoom で参加している方にご案内です。えー、発表前に Zoom の操作を練習をします。えー、this is an announcement for attendees in, the, in this Zoom meeting. Practice operating Zoom before the next talk. In questions and answers, raise your hand in Zoom. At the bottom of the Zoom screen, you can raise your hand from participants. Click raise hand to become familiar with the operation. Zoom の画面の下に参加者アイコンというものがあります。そこから挙手の機能が、挙手ができますので、操作に慣れるために挙手をしてみてください。OK? OK, thank you very much. Please put your hand down. Yeah, ありがとうございます。えー、では、手の挙手の方を下ろしていただいて大丈夫です。引き続き、Zoom 参加者へのお知らせです。For, for uh, announcement for attendees, you can write your question and thought in the Zoom chat during the talk. トーク中は、Zoom のチャットに質問や感想を書いていただいて大丈夫です。This is an announcement for attendees from YouTube Live. The hashtag from For this room is PyCon JP number three. Please feel free to tweet your thoughts and observations with the hashtag. YouTube を見ている方にご連絡です。この部屋のハッシュタグは PyCon JP number three です。感想や気づきなどぜひハッシュタグをつけてツイートしてみてください。Now we are going to start Mark's presentation. The title is Combining async IO and thread in the same application. The presentation time is 13 minutes, including questions and answers. Before the presentation, the speaker will read the paper for a microphone test. Mark, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So, my name is Mark Andre Lemberg. Uh, the title of my pre presentation is Combining Async, I.O. and Threads in a Single Application. My presentation will be in English. The presentation materials are in English as well. I will publish them after the talk to uh, Compass. Um, I agree to have my picture taken during my presentation and I will comply with the PyCon Japan Code of Conduct. Okay, thank you. So should I start yes. sharing my screen now? Yes. yes. Mark, okay. please share your screen again. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, okay, perfect. So hello and welcome. Good afternoon in Japan. Uh, for me, it's early in the morning. Um, I'm joining from, from Düsseldorf in Germany. Um, you know, having J PyCon Japan online gives me the, the, the chance to, to join the conference. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to join the conference. I was there over the last two years and I enjoyed it very much. So I thought that I'd give a talk in the online version of PyCon Japan as well. I'm going to talk about uh, async IO and threads, uh, a topic that uh, I had to dive into because I had um, an application that I wanted to write using both async IO and threads. So first of, all, uh, first of all, a bit about myself. I'm Mark Lemberg. Um, I have a company, a consulting company called Egenix. I consult as senior software architect or interim CTO. I'm also the EuroPython chair 
uh, and we just had the Euro Python online conference uh, last month, so I, I know what PyCon Japan is currently doing and how much work it is, and I very much appreciate their efforts to put everything online. Uh, it's a lot more work than doing an in-person conference, so this is something that is really uh, working very well for the short time that you had to prepare everything. Uh, I also do a lot of, uh, you know, Python uh, Python interaction with the with the code itself, with the community. So I'm a PSF fellow. I'm a Python core developer. I've used Python for quite a while, so I guess that's enough introduction. Um, before diving into the details, I want to uh, clarify a few terms that uh, are being used in the talk. So. Uh, we are basically using three ter three terms here, synchronous, threaded, and asynchronous. Uh, just want to give a short intro of what I mean with those uh, terms. So synchronous is uh, all about executing everything, every instruction one after the other. Whenever you hit some I.O., for example, you have to wait for external resources to, to send you back data. So um, this waiting is, of course, not a very efficient way to to use your resources, uh, given that you have so many cores in your in your CPU. Um, the nice thing about synchronous is that timing is not a problem, so everything runs uh, deterministically, so you can you know exactly when something is happening. The second term is uh, threaded execution. Threaded execution is something that is a managed by the operating system, not by your application. So basically you say, okay, I want to run these synchronous parts of my program in parallel. And then you ask the, the OS to manage that for you. And the OS then gives you back a thread and each thread executes one of these synchronous parts in your program. You don't have much control over what's happening uh, with the threads. Um, the, the execution can literally happen at the same time. Uh, so you can have multiple cores, for example, assigned to those threads, and then each core will execute uh, a thread on its own. This, of course, results in a problem that your execution is not deterministic anymore, so you don't know exactly when something is happening in your uh, computer. Uh, but of course, there are ways to, to work around this. You can synchronize threads, you can have logs so that one thread waits for the other. Um, something that you always have to be aware of that is uh, that delays can happen. So something uh, may not execute exactly at the time when you expect it. Uh, there may be something else going on in between. And and so uh, this is something to, to be aware of. And another major problem with threads is that sharing of data is hard. Because uh, all the threads have access to the same memory, you have to protect the memory and the objects that you use in the memory uh, against access by other threads, because otherwise you can have s situations where you, for example, you increment um, um, a counter in one thread and then you decrement it in the other thread more or less at the same time, and then uh, the, the program does not execute as you probably thought it would. So the nice thing about threads, though, is that you can actually efficiently use your resources. So you can make use of all the cores that you have in your, in your uh, application, in your uh, in your CPU. Um, another way to do this is asynchronous processing. Asynchronous is, is different than threading. You don't ask the OS to basically handle the, the parallel execution for you, or the, the, uh, the, the, um, um, the execution of different parts uh, in a way that looks as if it were parallel. But instead, what you do is you control everything within the application itself. And, and the way you do that is you pass control over to an invent loop. I'm going to go into that detail a, a little bit um, later in the talk. The event loop then takes care of managing that uh, the different parts get executed. Now, this only works if all the parts of your code actually participate in this scheme. So the, the, the parts, for example, that are running I.O. in your application, they have to give back control to this event loop so that the event loop can then pass on control to other parts, which uh, could then execute while one part of the code is waiting for I.O. So this is a major difference compared to threading. In threading, basically everything can happen in parallel. And while one thread is waiting, another thread can execute uh, without having the two communicate with, with each other. Now, why are, are we looking at this? Um, the, the main reason here is that 
In Python, we have what's called the GIL, the Global Interpreter Lock. Um, this was introduced early on in Python. It was introduced at a time when threat programming was just, you know, starting. Python is, you know, rather old in terms of, uh, you know, computer uh, timelines, and and so at at that time, threats were just starting to to become popular, and so. Uh, because Python was was also supposed to run in a threaded environment, um, Guido thought that it would be a good idea to to have a GIL protect the especially the increments and the decrements that you have on Python objects, uh, and then this GIL essentially makes sure that the Python interpreter is only run um, by one thread at any point in time. Now. Of course, this is, is a very easy way to, to make Python compatible to multi-threading environments, but at the same time, of course, it, it limits the, the way that you use multiple threads in your Python application. So essentially what happens is that the, the Python interpreter, the, the C eval loop that we have as the virtual machine in Python, uh, this virtual machine can only be run by one thread at a time, and all the other threads have to wait. Now, of course, this is not very efficient because uh, even though when you have I/O, you can you can then tell the OS to uh, give control back to to other parts of uh, to other threads running the Python interpreter. Um, it's it's not possible to actually execute code simultaneously. So. This is why this this idea of asynchronous processing uh, came to be, and this is this was thought of as a way to basically work around this issue. Now, what's our goal? Our goal is to to use the CPUs that we have with so many cores as efficiently as possible with Python. Um, unfortunately, with a threaded environment, which would be the obvious thing to do if you have multiple cores, uh, does not really work that well because of the GIL. The GIL prevents you to use everything efficiently. Um, and this is why asynchronous applications have become popular in the in recent years. Uh, a couple of examples for asynchronous applications are Tornado, for example, a web server. Starlet is a new one. Uh, a chat server, Discord, for example, uses asynchronous processing. Uh, the Home Assistant, you might know, it's an IoT server. This uses um, asynchronous processing as well. So essentially everything that has to do with, that has to process some kind of an event uh, and then keeps a lot of time waiting for these events is a very good uh, use case for an asynchronous application. Whereas other applications like database connections, they um, typically run synchronous. You don't have much control over these in Python because they're typically run by external code. Now what you want to ideally do is you want to combine those two, so you get the benefits of both in your application. Now first let's have a look at what happens with the GIL when running in a multi-threaded environment. And this is essentially what we had up until we, we uh, then got the asynchronous processing introduced. So what you see here on the right is uh, three threads running on three cores in your CPU. And uh, if you look at the uh, this this orange um, the orange boxes, this is actually Python running code. And then the yellow boxes, this is basically a thread waiting for the GIL. And then these uh, blue boxes here, this is I.O. So if you look here, you have three threads running, you have three cores uh, in your application, but you see that only ever one thread is actually executing Python code. So it goes like this. Which means that the only benefit that you get here is sorry the only benefit that you get is uh, that when something waits for I/O you can actually pass control to another thread and then you can have that thread execute some other Python code while you're still waiting. Um, if you look into that a bit more closely, sorry it's switching a bit faster. So if you look in into this a bit more closely, if you leave out all the um, the orange chunks here. All this time that you see here, all the colored pieces, is basically waiting for something. It's not doing anything. And if you look at this um, column here, then this is the actual execution that's happening. And if you combine all those, then you see that all the threads are basically just using, there's just one flow of execution 
even though you're, you're using three threads, you're using three cores in your CPU, you're not really making efficient use of, of those three cores because the three cores actually execute just one flow of execution. Now, of course, this is not ideal. So uh, you can do a little better. You can try to saturate your one single core, even though there is waiting for I.O., for example. And the way to do that is to have asynchronous processing and have the asynchronous processing uh, basically switch the flow of execution to other parts of the program which can continue working while other parts are waiting for I.O. So what you see here is a single process, a single thread, but you have three tasks running in parallel. And if you look here at the three tasks, what happens is that you make efficient use of the, of the process because if you combine all of these and you leave out all the waiting that's done in the various different tasks, the waiting is not actually happening because it's, it's, uh, what's, what's happening is that the task is basically put aside and, and then control is given to some other task. So there is no waiting, it's basically just uh, the, the task is put to sleep for a while and then it recovers later on to, to pick up the results of, for example, the I.O. So what you have as a result is you have a single flow of, of execution that continuously 100% uses that particular process or thread uh, running on that core. So what you can do with asynchronous processing is to can saturate your, your single core that you have. So it's a much more efficient use of that core. Now, of course, you want to use all the cores that you have in your application. So how can you use asynchronous processing to, to use all the cores? Now, uh, there are multiple ways to do this. One way is to basically have your application run in multiple processes, and then the processes are run by the OS on different cores. So in, in this example that you see here, you have three processes running, and those three processes um, are run on three cores. Each uses asynchronous processing, so each is saturated and uses 100% of the, of the um, available CPU time that you have there. So th this would be one way to do it. This is a very typical use case, for example, for web server, because the web server gets, inf gets uh, requests coming in, and those requests coming in are then distributed to the uh, different cores, and each core then can process one request and then send back the results. It doesn't always work. Uh, you can not always make this work like that, but in, in use cases where you're waiting for events, this is um, kind of an ideal way to do it. Now, there are other ways as well. What you can do is you can use a multi-threaded uh, setup, use asynchronous processing, and then have the other threads not run Python code. Because, like I said, the GIL only protects the Python interpreter. It doesn't prevent other threads, other you know, non-Python code to run. And this is exactly the use case that I, that I was after, because uh, I wanted to combine an application that is running inside the same process, but using different threads, and it's not running Python code, and I wanted to combine that with an application that was written asynchronously. So uh, this is the use case I'm going to show in an example. Now, just a quick intro to how asynchronous processing works. Uh, we have two keywords since Python 3.5 for this. Uh, we have async, which is uh, used when defining a, a function. The, the function then gets turned into what's called a coroutine. A coroutine is very similar to a subroutine, as you know it, except that it's uh, the, the coroutine will actually cooperate with an event loop in that it will have certain uh, places in that function which give up control to the calling um, event loop. And so that makes it possible to pass back control. And this passing back of control is done using the await keyword. And uh, Python has a, an async IO package which basically wraps uh, all the event loops and other helpers that you need for actually making everything happen. Now, if you look at an example, if you compare synchronous code to asynchronous code, it looks very similar. Um, the, the major difference here is that, of course, you use the async to define your coroutine here instead of just the def as you have in the synchronous uh, code. You have to be careful not to put blocking code into your, um, into your function. So the time sleep, for example, here, this would be blocking. It would actually sleep for two seconds in this case. Of course, in the async example, what you want to do is you want to wait for this 
and you use a special function for this instead of time sleep you use async io sleep because uh, that actually makes it possible to give back control while it's still waiting for two seconds uh, and so this is the, the the major difference you use these await statements in here in your function whenever you wait for something whenever you wait for io when you wait for you know for example here like a delay uh, or you wait for something else to happen maybe you have a long running calculation running then you can uh, wait for that calculation to finish and then uh, the something else that you need to be aware of is that actually running this function is you just you don't just call the function to have it run but you have to put it into a what's called a task and then you have to wrap that task uh, using uh, async io helpers and then you run it inside the event loop so that's how it works in, in async io versus in synchronous processing you just call the function and you're done so i can basically skip over these uh, what async io uh, what async uh, code does not like is blocking code so like I said whenever you have something that can take a longer while you have to make sure that your function gives up control to the calling party so to, to the event loop in that case because all these task objects are run inside the event loop and the event loop can only pass control to other tasks that you have in your application if your coroutine gives up control in these cases. If it doesn't give up control, it won't break the application. The async will still work, but the other task won't get a chance to actually uh, make use of that waiting time that you have in that function. And so the waiting time will actually uh, be applied to the whole application. Essentially, your program becomes synchronous again at that point, and this is something that you want to avoid. Uh, you have to be careful about this because you don't necessarily see it. Uh, you you don't if if there's some code that you have that takes a long while to run, uh, and other code could run at that point. There's nothing signaling that to you, so you have to actually look at your code and see where the different places are that could possibly give up control. This is what's called the collaborative uh, approach to to processing. So all the code bits that uh, take part in your application have to collaborate now of course um, if you run code outside your application and you want to run uh, for example you know long running uh, process or long running thread outside the the python execution then you have to somehow make it possible for the event loop to still work with that so what you have to do is you have to encapsulate whatever you want to do in a way that makes it possible for the event loop to start that particular task and also to give up control again back to the event loop so that you don't block everything else and the the way to do it with threads is to run something inside what async io calls an executor executor takes care of controlling whatever happens and also giving back control to the event loop uh, as much as possible and there's a a thread pool executor which I'm going to use for running other threads and uh, this is defining concurrent futures so that's uh, how I could actually implement the idea that I had because uh, the idea behind this why I wanted to look into this was that I wanted to have for your Python I wanted to have a stream bot and the stream bot was supposed to provide a preview to what's currently happening in various streams in your uh, in, in the conference um, and the, w the way I wanted to do that is to, to have VLC. VLC is a, um, it's a streaming tool that, you, that runs on Linux and other platforms as well, uh, where you can stream, for example, uh, YouTube uh, videos like what we have here at PyCon Japan. And you can have VLC take snapshots of these YouTube streams. And then I wanted to take those snapshots and then send them directly to Discord, the chat tool that we used for the conference. Um, and put all of that into one application. So I had two parts in here. One part was uh, Discord. Discord.py, like I mentioned, is an async uh, framework, so it uses async. And VLC can be put directly into the process using Python VLC, which is a wrapper around VLC, and it runs VLC in separate threads. So um, I had to combine those two. Now, the way it works is 
that you first you start your Discord bot. Discord then works asynchronously, which is why you see all these asyncs here in front of the devs. Um, then I had to use a thread executor. You basically just say how many workers you want to use, how many threads you want to start in that uh, thread pool, and then whenever you do something, then the thread pool gives you access to one of these threads and you can execute your code. Um, then what you do in the bot is you define, whenever a command comes in, you define what to do with that command, and uh, there are several commands in that bot, but uh, the, the one that I want to show here is the watch one, which is telling the bot to start streaming a certain uh, YouTube URL and then send um, pictures of the snapshots of that the stream to that channel that uh, executed that command. So what I do here is I, when, whenever I get this command, um, I go in here and then I start the streaming. And you see the await here. Await means that I call this function, but the the function, uh, the sorry, the method in this case, uh, is can give back control to the outer event loop, and so the the bot itself, the bot event loop that I have, can continue running without blocking. If you look at the stream URL method, the async method, then there are two parts in here. One is I have to start the the VLC player, and I started whenever I see that this particular um, uh, snapshot file name is not being used. So the way that VLC works is that you give it, uh, you, you tell it uh, to do a snapshot and then to write it to a file. So by looking at the file name, you can, and then f uh, seeing whether the file name is already uh, registered, you can see whether the VLC is actually running for that particular stream or not. So this takes care of actually starting the VLC player in a separate thread. And then once I have that done, um, I can then go here and then I can take regular snapshots. So this is basically an infinite loop. Um, it looks for the image, the image file, the file name here. And then when it finds that, it builds, some, uh, it builds a message for Discord and sends it to the channel. So this is how the VLC player gets started. Uh, it's a synchronous function. I can make that synchronous because there are other places uh, where I can um, where, where I can give back control. And then uh, this this then uh, sorry um, I mixed that up. It it runs. This is the async function that gives back control. So the run VLC player gives back control. Um, the run VLC player uses the start VLC player uh, to run the to run a thread uh, using the executor. Sorry about that. So um, this is this is actually where the uh, where the branching happens from the async uh, process into the threading process. And so this this starts in the threading uh, concept, and then uh, after that you take the the snapshots here. So this is this is not uh, sending the snapshots to Discord, but this is actually telling VLC to take a snapshot and write it to a file. And again, this happens uh, asynchronously uh, because I can now work in an asynchronous context here because I have VLC itself running in external threads. So this is how it looks. This is how it works. Um, I can try to give you a small demo maybe. Um, so I have VLC running here. Uh, actually, I don't have VLC running yet. Uh, I have the bot running. You see the Discord bot here. Um, this is already logged in into Discord. I can now go to Discord here. And I already prepared this, so I have to write this again. This is the command that I run. Pass that to to the bot. And then what happens is back here, you see that VLC gets started by the bot. And you, I don't know if you can see it, but it's actually a moving picture of the ISS. This is the ISS flying over um, the Earth, and this is a live picture from the ISS. Um, and what you see here is the, the bot taking regular snapshots. So uh, you see that it's, it's taking a snapshot, and it's sending that snapshot to the bot, and in the bot, in Discord itself, you then see the regular 
snapshots being taken and sent to the Discord chat. And this is how we worked at the conference and it worked quite nicely. So um, this was basically a good success. Right, and that was all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Again, thanks for the organizers for running this conference. And um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, we have a few minutes for a question. If you have any questions for Mr. Ma, please click the raising hand button in Zoom. Just a moment, please. え、質問のある方は、え、ズームの挙手機能を使用して、え、いただければと思います。少々お待ちください。そうです。どなたか、誰か。では質問がありましたので、では私の方で、yes, yes, how do you... uh, yes. yes, how yes,、uh, how do you decide the value of interval? Uh, such as fifty、uh, millisecond in your call ISA. Let me just go back.、Um... You mean that the interval here to to、uh, actually take the snapshots, or you mean the interval to I don't know whatever other interval I have in here. So what I'm doing here is I'm I'm、um, okay. So the the interval ah this one you mean the interval here fifteen、uh, seconds. So what I'm doing here is I use that interval to determine. How long to sleep between sending images to the to the Discord chat,、uh, and this is not really a technical、uh, thing to be aware of.、Um, if you look at the the code that's actually taking the snapshots, this is the code for taking the snapshots.、Um, it's taking the snapshots at a at a higher rate. So you have an interval of five here,、uh, five seconds. So the VLC actually takes a, a picture every five seconds, but When actually when running the code against the Discord channel, I found that if you send images too frequently, it basically causes too much,、uh, you know, it causes stress on people watching it in Discord, and this is why basically we we turned this、uh, down to 15 seconds. And you can also see that I only keep the last、uh, six images around,、uh, so. Again, this is something to avoid、uh, stress when 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 watching it. It doesn't look good if you have too many images in the channel, because Discord actually keeps all the images. And what、uh, what I'm doing here is I'm deleting everything that is、uh, prior to those six images. Thank you. So this is how it, this is how it runs. Any other questions?、Uh, oh, sorry. The time is oh, uh, uh, one uh, one minute left. So the time it's time to finish. So we will end. Ah,、uh, uh, sorry. Okay. So thank you very much again. Mark, uh, so uh, sorry, uh, it's time to finish. So, 
thank you. We will end Mr. Mark's talk. So thank you very much for your talk. Okay. Everybody, thank please you. give a big, please give a big, a big round of applause to the speaker. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please let me know when I should stop the screen sharing. So, yes.